course, as you know, no surprise in this, uh, is the time that we celebrate or acknowledge the birth of Jesus, or it celebrates good word. It's good to celebrate and uh, take into account. Uh, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, only two of those record the birth of Christ. That would be Luke's Gospel and Matthew's Gospel. Mark and John start with the ministry of Jesus. And so if we want to read about the birth of Christ and talk about its significance and importance, we could turn to uh, Matthew's Gospel or to Luke's Gospel. So what I'd like to do today is read part of the story from Luke's Gospel and comment on it and talk about the significance of it that Luke emphasizes. And then next week talk briefly about Matthew's Gospel, Matthew's account. Because both of them tell different things. Um, you know, when we see a manger scene, as we call it, or a nativity scene. Uh, we have the wise men and the shepherds and, uh, and the angels and so forth. You know, neither one of, uh, neither one of the gospels tell all of that. Uh, Matthew's gospel tells us about the wise men, but Luke doesn't tell us about the wise men. Luke tells us about shepherds, but Matthew doesn't tell us about shepherds. So if you read them together, when you see a nativity scene, it's kind of compi compi uh, combining and compiling all those things together. So there's different things that we see from each, each one and different things that these different writers look at. So today I'd like to look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, and read briefly about the account of Jesus' birth from Luke. But there are some things that are in common, some emphases that uh, Matthew and Luke bring out that they emphasize that are in common with both of them, and I'll point that out to you as we go along. I'd like to begin reading with... Um, well, let's just start with verse 1. This is the traditional uh, place to start reading this story. If you've ever seen the Charlie Brown Christmas special, this is what Linus reads at the end when he's, after they've done their Christmas play and, and Charlie Brown's saying, well, what is the real meaning of Christmas? Well, Linus says, I'll tell you what it means. And they turn the house lights down and a spotlight comes on. This is what he reads. And this is a good passage to read. Uh, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, it says this. And it came to pass in those days, there went out a decree from Caesar... Augustus, that all the world should be taxed. And uh, yeah, that's just like a political leader, just not enough just to tax what in my local vicinity. Let's tax the whole world. That's, that strikes me as funny. Anyway, verse 2. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. That puts it sort of in a historical context for us because we can read about Caesar Augustus and these different rulers in, in, in history. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. Verse 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto a city, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Verse 8 says, And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Now, we could stop right there and just comment on the fact that, you know, as part of the Christmas story, we're accustomed to this, and this doesn't really get our attention, but, but just think for a minute, uh, if you didn't already know what was going to happen, didn't know the Christmas story, and didn't know anything about it, if you were just out in the field in the middle of the night, if you were a shepherd out there in the dark, and suddenly an angel appears, and there's this bright light and this glory shining on you, you'd be afraid too. <laughs> you know, anybody, you'd be startled for one thing, probably terrified would be a better word, uh, you know, What's, you don't know what to make of it. And besides that, a supernatural occurrence like this would be frightening under any circumstances. I mean, I guarantee if you're just going about your daily routine and an angel appears, you'd be a little bit startled and, and disturbed. And, I mean, we tend to think, you know, reading it on Sunday morning in our, you know, Christian uh, attitude about things, oh, yes, an angel, how wonderful. No, you'd be scared, <laughs> you know. If I was just, you know, going about my business at home and an angel appeared, I'd be scared. Anybody would be. Well, it's, it's easy to understand that. So it, they're, they're a little bit disturbed, and this hadn't happened in their lives, I'm sure. And they didn't have this story to read in the Bible, so they have no precedent. They're just minding their own business. And besides that, 
they're just ordinary people. They're not religious scholars reading in the Bible about angels. They're not, uh, they're not especially holy people. They're just ordinary, everyday people like you would uh, rub shoulders with in your everyday life. Just ordinary people, not especially religious people. They're not out there having a Bible study. They're just shepherds out there in the field watching their flocks, and here comes an angel, so they're afraid. Maybe on several different grounds. You know, maybe, maybe they're thinking to themselves, I, I knew God was going to get me one day, and now he's here to, he's here to you know, zap me with his, with his judgment or something. Uh, they might have been thinking all those things. So the angel begins in verse 10 to say this, Fear not. It's interesting. That's how angels generally start their, uh, their discourse with human beings. That's generally what they say. That's because we tend to be afraid when confronted with something like this. And so the angel says, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Now let's just comment on that for a moment. Uh, after the angel, first of all, says, fear not or don't be afraid, we could make the point that angels generally say this. That's what they say. So the message coming, you see, angels aren't speaking uh, on their own impulse. They're not free agents. They don't just go around saying what they want. They come with a message from God. They are delivery uh, beings, delivering messages, and they come with a message from God. So you could say this, verse 10, he says, fear not. The message coming from heaven to, to humanity starts with this message, don't be afraid. Uh, because generally, uh, the reason people might be afraid of angels is the same reason they might be afraid of God. Now, I'm not talking about the fear of God that we talk about in, in church sometimes, meaning respect or reverence. Now, that's one thing. But, you know, I think most people in life in general uh, are afraid of God just in fear terms because they're, they know that uh, they have a consciousness of uh, falling short of what's expected and consciousness of sins and a consciousness of, um, of transgressions and mistakes. And so they're afraid of God because what they expect to get from God is anger and punishment and like God's mad at them. I think if you just stop the ordinary person on the street and got in a discussion about it, most people you'd find think that God's upset with them, God's mad at them, and they're afraid of God, and try to avoid running into uh, any people who speak on behalf of God, avoid coming to church, avoid things like that, because it makes them uncomfortable. But see, the message coming from heaven is not, I'm going to get you for that, and I saw what you did, and I'm going to make you pay. The message coming from heaven is fear not. That's what God told these angels to say, fear not. And you know what? If he sent an angel to you personally, to your life, into, walked right into your house, first thing he'd say is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God, knowing everything about you and everything about your life and all the circumstances of your life, first thing he'd say to you is, don't be afraid. That's his message here. Fear not. So I think it's interesting and important that he opens with that. But then he says, behold, I bring to you good tidings of great joy. Notice that in verse 10. Good tidings is just another way of saying, that's a fancy way of saying good news. I bring you good news of great joy. Now, of course, we know from reading this before, and, and I just read it a moment ago, it's talking about the birth of Jesus and the coming of Jesus into the world. And that's supposed to be a message of good news and great joy. And I think if when we're talking about Christianity and talking about the gospel and talking about the things that we talk about, if it doesn't inspire joy, if it doesn't come across as good news, then it's not the gospel. That's what I say. I think we're talking about the wrong thing if it doesn't inspire good news and great joy. And speaking of people wanting to avoid God and, and avoid being in church, I think one reason, one reason that motivates people to stay away from church is they don't expect to hear something good that will produce joy. Here's what most people expect they're going to get when they come to church. A message about you and your behavior. <laughs> kind of like this. You better straighten up and fly right, you bunch of backslidden buzzards or God's going to get you. That, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what most people expect to hear. Well, or, you know, you can understand why you might not want to hear something like that. It might be true, but that's not good news. Now, listen, don't you think God knows what's going on in our lives? Now, especially, you know, uh, people that are other than, you know, when <laughs> I'm talking now, of course, to the people. It's like a class, you know, when, when teachers get up and they get mad about the people who are absent. Well, you're talking to the ones that are there, you know. The ones who are absent, you know, aren't hearing this message, so it's no good to do that. Uh, <laughs> but what I started to say was this. Uh, if, 
if you expect to hear a message of, uh, of uh, straighten up and fly right and a message about your performance, that's not going to inspire, it might be true, but it doesn't inspire good news and it's not going to inspire great joy. Uh, God knows about our lives. He knows better than we do where we fall short and where our mistakes and transgressions and all those kinds of things are. But rather than send a message of, see, he could have sent a message to these shepherds saying that if he wanted to. He could have said, you shepherds, I know each one of you by name and I know everything you've done wrong. I've seen your whole life and I know all your mistakes. He knows all that. He knows that about us too. But he does not send a message like that and that's not the gospel. The gospel is not about exposing everything wrong that we've done. The gospel is about God who knows all that but yet has done something about it for us and sends us good tidings of great joy rather than a message of, uh, that inspires fear and, uh, and uh, anxiety. He says, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Well, and it shall be to all people. Notice that. Which shall be to all people. It's not exclusive. See, people who think that God picks and chooses who's going to be saved and throws the rest away are wrong. It's to all people. It's we who choose, not him. It's we as individuals who choose whether to respond to him or not. He wills for everybody to be saved. He's done what he did for every single person. He didn't, he's no respecter of persons. He doesn't exclude anyone. It's individuals who either don't respond or ignore it. Uh, we're the ones who choose, not him. Which shall be to all people. And I just point out to you that it says all right there. I don't know how you get around that. I don't know how you read it any other way. This good news of the birth of Jesus is to all people. Then he says, this shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Now, we're used to that. You know, we're accustomed to seeing Jesus' birth in a, in a stable with animals and cows. And there's usually a camel and, you know. But if you didn't already know about the Christmas story, that would be a strange sight. You don't ordinarily see a baby lying in the, in the feeding trough you know, with, the, with the hay. That's not something that would be, that would be a little bit out of the ordinary. That's not a normal thing. And then notice um, verse 13. Here, this is the angel of the Lord so far has given this message to the shepherds. And it's been good so far. It's a message of good news. And he said, oh, I, I skipped a little bit. Let's go back to verse 11. I don't want to skip over this. It shall be to all people, verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, notice what he says, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, when you read the word Savior, what does it make you think of? Well, what it should make you think of is what the word implies is someone who saves. Now, Jesus, as we know from having read the Gospels and know about, knowing about his life, Jesus did many things. He could have been described in this introductory message by these angels in many different ways. They could have said, for unto you this day is born a teacher, because he taught. Jesus was a good teacher. But most of his teaching, if you'll analyze it, is aimed towards uh, steering people towards believing in him, if you analyze his teaching. But I've talked to people many times, more than once, who say to me that they, uh, they think that the Christian life is about following the teachings of Jesus. Now, I'm not against the teachings of Jesus. I think they're fine. I think it's good. I'm all for that. But just notice here that the angel could have introduced him as a teacher. Now, what I, the, the point that I'm getting at is this. If a person says, I'm a Christian because I follow the teachings of Jesus, I'm going to say, following the teachings of Jesus doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. Um, I like to read about history, and I like to read about historical figures. And I remember reading one time about uh, the great, they would, uh, you know, in, in India, they call Mahatma Gandhi a uh, uh, the father of their country like we do about George Washington because Mahatma Gandhi led India out of uh, British rule in, into an independent state and Mahatma Gandhi is a Hindu and he was not ashamed of that he let everybody know that he was a, as a Hindu nevertheless he commented I read a, a statement from him that he admired the teachings of Jesus and he tried to put into practice the teachings of Jesus especially when Jesus said turn the other cheek Mahatma Gandhi practiced uh, nonviolent resistance. That's how he went about things. And he said he was inspired by the teachings of Jesus. Now here's a man who followed the teachings of Jesus, and that was a pretty hard one to follow, turn the other cheek, you know, that's not a, an easy one to follow. But he was in no way a Christian. He didn't claim to be a Christian. He claimed to be a Hindu. So what I'm saying is, the angels could have said, unto you this day is born a teacher. 
Uh, but he didn't. he didn't. He said a Savior. Now, you know, in, in life, you know, all kinds of different people have different kinds of attitudes about things. But I'm saying just to follow the teachings of Jesus doesn't necessarily make you a, Christ, a, a Christian. You need to acknowledge him as a Savior, you see. A person who tries to follow the teachings of Jesus will do so to a greater or lesser extent depending on their own ability. But that des doesn't necessarily get you where you need to be with God just to put into practice the teachings of Jesus. The angel could have also said, uh, unto you this day is born a good example. I've, I've had this conversation with people too. Well, I think Jesus is a good, I try to follow the example of Jesus in my life. Well, good for you, I think that's fine. That doesn't make you a Christian though. <laughs> Again, we could say that about Mahatma Gandhi. He tried to follow the example of Jesus who used nonviolence. You never find Jesus getting into a fist fight or pulling out a sword and chopping somebody's ear off <laughs> like Peter did. You don't find Jesus employing weapons or violence. He's a good example to follow uh, for that kind of lifestyle. But the angels did not say, for unto you this day is born a good example. Now, I'm not against the example of Jesus. That's the best one you can follow. But you see, following his teachings, endeavoring to follow them, endeavoring to follow his example, does not get you to where you need to be. And here's why. Oh, let's just make this point. Jesus as a savior means that he does the saving. If you are following his example, it means you are doing it. Now it's a question between who is going to get the job done, you or him. Now in the Christian world, I think the general thought is amongst most people that it's all about me and turning over a new leaf and trying to do better and I'm gonna redouble my efforts tomorrow and I'm all for that too, I think that's good. It's good to make changes in your life and, and put out your best effort. But here's what you need to know. None of that is going to get you where you need to be with God, in a relationship with God. Because if it did, you wouldn't need Jesus. Did you all hear that? God did not have to go to all the trouble to send Jesus into the world. He's called the only begotten Son of God. He's called God manifested in the flesh. As we'll read about next week, uh, he was born of a virgin. Uh, that, that was quite an uh, accomplishment. We didn't need all of that, and we'll talk about that more in detail next week, but we didn't need all this effort if we were just, if it was going to be about us trying to make our lives better, and I'm all for that, by the way, but uh, if it's all about that, then we don't need a Savior. We don't need Jesus. But you see, the angel introduced him as a Savior because what we really needed more than anything else was saving. And although we try to follow the example of Jesus, we're not perfect at it. I'm not. I don't know anybody who is. I've never met anybody who claims to be perfect. And although we admire the teachings of Jesus and try to employ them to the best we can, uh, we all understand, I hope we understand, that we're not perfect at it. We make mistakes, we fall short, you know. Uh, we're not perfect as individuals. Well, listen, here's the thing. Here's the thing you gotta understand. God's perfect, and he's perfectly righteous, and he's perfectly holy. You are not perfect, you're not perfectly righteous, you're not perfectly holy, and though you might do better than the person next to you, you're not going to be perfect enough to stand in the presence of a perfect God. What we need, what you and I need, what every person in this world needs is a Savior who comes to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. Now, I sometimes, and you've heard this example before, um, and, and I hate to just use the same examples again and again and again, but just uh, to illustrate it, it's like this. Here's, here's the way I like to make the analogy. A savior is like the lifeguard on the beach. The lifeguard on the beach is not there for any other purpose but to rescue people when they're drowning. Now, as long as you can swim out in the water and, and get back to shore all by yourself under your own power, if, as long as you can do it yourself, you don't need the lifeguard, right? If you can do it yourself, you don't need the lifeguard. In fact, when I've been uh, to the pool and to the beach, those lifeguards, when I've been there, aren't doing much of anything. <laughs> Bunch of teenagers sitting up there on the high platform getting a suntan. They have no function until somebody needs to be saved. And when someone needs to be saved, that means they've gotten out in the water and they're going down and they're, and they're drowning and they can't get back under their own power. That's what the lifeguard is there for. Now, when the person is drowning and going down for the last time and about to be lost, the lifeguard does not stand up on that high platform and say, listen, you out there that's drowning, listen as I read to you from the swimming manual and give you a good teaching. <laughs> I'll give you a real good teaching here. The teaching is not what's needed, right? If a person is drowning. Teaching, you know, when you're saved, 
once he's rescued you and saved you, you've got all the time in the world to, to look at the swimming manual. Right? You understand the analogy? Also, what's not needed is the person's out there drowning and for the lifeguard to stand up on that high platform. Look at me up here. Look at how, how I do it. See how I move my arms and legs? Watch my example. Just follow my example. Too late for that. After you're saved, after you're rescued, you've got all the time in the world to think about what a good example the lifeguard might be. But you see, when a person is drowning, when a person is lost and going down, what you need more than anything else, more than a teaching, more than an example, you need for the lifeguard to get down from where he is and come right to where you are and throw his arms around you and do for you what you can't do for yourself. And that's the way the angels introduced Jesus. Unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior. A Savior comes to save. And that's what he came to do. So the angel, I think, is emphasizing that. In fact, that's why Jesus came into this world, to come into the human condition and to rescue us. And what's not made specific in this reading of it that we'll read next week in Matthew, rescue us specifically from our sins, to rescue us from the things that disqualify us from having a relationship with God. And he does do that and did do that and remove that as an obstacle. Uh, we'll study that in a little more detail uh, next week. Okay, uh, he comes as a savior. Now, I'm, I'm not against his teaching or his example. He was also a prophet. He was a healer. He was many things. He, and he still is all those things. But the primary thing, more than anything else, the first and foremost, most important thing that Jesus is, is a savior, emphasized here by the angels. Then he tells about the swaddling clothes, and it says, verse 13, Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God. So with this angel who was just given this message of good news, now there's a whole gang of them, a whole multitude. We don't know how many that is. It could be hundreds. It could be thousands. You think they were afraid before. Imagine what that would look like, the whole field covered with angels. That would be an awe-inspiring sight. And listen to what these angels are saying. They're not silent. They're saying, glory to God in the highest. Stop right there. God, when it says glory to God in the highest, that means God is up here in heaven, the highest, the highest of the high, see, uh, above everything else, above and beyond everything else that is beneath, and he is in the highest. And what about in the highest? Well, to God in the highest we give glory, glory to God in the highest. But then it says, after the comma, and on earth. Now, the reason I'm, I'm focusing on the grammar here and the punctuation is because, in general, everybody reads this wrong. And you'll, you'll see signs during the Christmas season who get this all wrong. So I want you to notice the grammar and the punctuation because if you get it wrong, you get the wrong message. To God, glory, he's in the highest. But what about us here on earth? Well, and then it says, after the comma, and on earth, peace. Now, this might seem like I'm straining over, uh, splitting hairs here, but notice it doesn't say peace on earth. <laughs> now, you're going to see signs. I know you will during Christmas season that say peace on earth. And if you've got one in your yard, that's okay. I'm not saying there's anything bad about it. But I'm just saying this is not what they said. They didn't say peace on earth. Because when you put up a sign that says peace on earth, what you are implying to most people is a political condition of no more wars. And that would be great. I li I'd like that idea. But you see, ever since the dawn of time, since there's been civilization and recorded history, there has never been a time when there's no war. Now, I like to read history. I recommend reading history. I think you get a good perspective on on life and the, and the time in which we're living, the more history you read, the better you understand the, the present. And I love to read history. And I've read all kinds, of every history you can think of. And I've noticed from reading it, you never read about a period of time anywhere in the world where there's not some kind of war going on. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can pick any, any place, any place in the world, and you're going to read about war. Now, if Jesus came to eliminate that, he failed because it's been going right on just like it never stopped. And you, in fact, you could make the case that it's gotten worse in more recent times. You know, after World War I, they called that the war to end all wars. It was so bad. It was so horrifying. It was so devastating. So many people died. And then they had another one, World War II, uh, that was even worse, you could say. Uh, more devastating weapons, uh, ending with, of course, the, the, the atomic bomb. Uh, this is not what the angels are talking about. When they, they didn't say peace on earth, implying some kind of uh, a political condition, they're talking about something far more important. Notice that instead of saying uh, peace on earth, they said on earth, peace, comma, goodwill toward men. Now, if you read it all together, you understand what the message is. 
to God from earth. We give glory to God. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, what? What's going, what about for us on earth? See, we're giving glory to God in the highest from earth to heaven. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Now, when it says toward men, that tells you that it's coming from somewhere to somewhere. Toward men means to us, to humanity. And it's coming from heaven. And what is coming from heaven to us is peace, goodwill. Peace and goodwill from heaven to earth. That's the message. Peace and goodwill from God to us. He's sending a message, uh, and Jesus coming into the world and being born is the focal point of this message, or the beginning of it. Here's God's attitude toward us. Peace and goodwill. He has goodwill towards men. Now, that, that's not me, that doesn't mean just the Christians. That doesn't mean just people sitting in church on Sunday morning. When it says peace, goodwill toward men, that's a word that implies everybody, humanity. The message from heaven to humanity is goodwill, not anger, not you better straighten up, not judgment, goodwill. You know, and this is so subtle the way it works and so all pervasive in the Christian world. I think the Christian world is dominated for the most part with this idea that God's mad, God's upset. God's just about had it. He's headed up to here. Anytime there's a disaster, it's God's mad. That's, that's what you'll hear. I remember 9-11 when it first happened. Remember that? Uh, you couldn't turn away from the television. We just watched, you know, ever, we just couldn't believe it. And just, it was so terrible and, you know, devastating. I remember within 24 hours of 9-11 seeing preachers, uh, well-known, you know, preachers that, whose names you'd recognize if I mentioned them. I don't want to recognize them because, or mention the name because I don't want you to think I'm necessarily criticizing them. I'm criticizing what they said. And they were just saying what everybody generally thinks. And this, I, I promise you, I heard it with my own ears. This is not hearsay. My own eyes and ears, I saw this on television. This, they said, is the judgment of God because of America's sins. Well, you know, uh, just on the face of it, you should know that that's not true. I mean, it doesn't make any logical sense, for one thing. Just picture God taking two airplanes full of innocent people and, and smashing them into two buildings because he's mad. That's like an infant in a playpen. That's like babies do that, you know. That's like saying God is like a little infant having a temper tantrum. But beyond that, the premise that underlies it is that God is mad. Now notice what the angel said, peace, goodwill toward men. Well, doesn't God know about everybody's sins? Yeah, he knows all about it. He knows more about it than you do. <laughs> he knows more about it than we do. Well, the, re the reason he doesn't say, I'm mad because of your sins and I'm going to get you for that is because he's sent a savior <laughs> to remedy the situation. And now, because the Savior has come to remedy the situation, his attitude towards humanity is peace and goodwill. Peace and goodwill. Now, peace means a state of uh, uh, no hostility. That's what that means. If it's peace between nations, like we were talking about before, that means hostilities have ceased. And now we could say there's friendship, or at least there's accommodation. That means there's been peace has been made. Now, specifically, Jesus made peace uh, in his death. Um, but God's treating it here in the message from these angels uh, as though it's just Jesus coming into the world. He says, okay, I'm counting it done. I'm counting that he's going to accomplish what he came to accomplish. And now the message is peace and goodwill. Just to emphasize that fact, let me uh, turn and read one other passage. And I'll close with this. I like to read this, so I don't want to miss a chance to read this. This is one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. Uh, it's in Colossians chapter 1. And I want you to notice this same language. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. This is the Apostle Paul talking. Now remember, remember something about the Apostle Paul, the man who's writing this. He's not just some guy writing down his ideas or opinions. The Apostle Paul was a persecutor of the Christians until Jesus appeared to him. <clears throat> his name was Saul. And he said, Saul, uh, I've appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a witness of the things which you've seen and of the things which I will appear to you. Uh, Jesus appeared to Saul, who changed his name to Paul, the Apostle Paul, and gave him a message. And if you read his writings, you find out that the message Jesus gave him to convey to us, by the way, is the message about what was accomplished, what was done, what was finished in the death of Christ. What did his death on the cross really mean? Now, we're talking today about his birth, but I'm going to say that his birth is looking forward to his whole work and his death. But notice what Paul here says. Remember the angel said, on earth peace goodwill toward men. 
Here Paul says in verse 20, Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Do you see that? That means that he made peace between us and God. Now, what, what, what would have, what was this, why, would, why did peace need to be made by the blood of his cross? Why did peace need to be made? Because we were, uh, before Jesus, we were, if it's just God on one side and us on the other side, our sins were a barrier. Our sins separated us from God. Our sins made us guilty. Our sins required God's punishment and judgment. And we were liable for that, his punishment and judgment in our life. But Jesus came and in our place went to the cross and he was punished in our place. So Paul says he made peace. In other words, the state of hostilities has ended. Notice he didn't say anything about you doing it. He said he did it. He made peace through the blood of his cross. You know, sometimes preachers are bad about this. Uh, go to the Old Testament, find some kind of a passage. Uh, like in Isaiah, there's a passage where Isaiah is talking to Israel. And, and, and he says, your sins have separated you from your God. Now, see, you know what? If I read that to you today and tried to tell you that's the message from God to you, I'd be lying to you. That is false. It's not true. It was true when he said it back there before Jesus came. But Jesus coming into the earth changed the equation. It changed the relationship between God and man. That message has no more validity for us because here Paul says he made peace through the blood of his cross. You notice how bluntly I said because I want to get that point across. I don't want to water that down any. Uh, he did it. Uh, through the blood of his cross, by him. You know why he said by him? Because he wants you to know that he did it all. By him, to reconcile all things to himself. And by that he means people. By him, twice he said it in this verse. You notice that twice he said by him. He did it, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. This is another way of saying on earth peace. Peace between heaven and earth. That's what he's saying. God made the peace. That's why it's a message of good tidings, of great joy. Because instead of God saying, you've got to do it, and you've got to fix it, and you've got to straighten it out, and you've got to make peace with me, God's saying, I already made peace with you. Verse 21. Now he comes to you. You notice in, that in verse 20, he didn't tell you anything. He didn't tell you to do anything. He's just telling you something God did. Verse 21. Here he's addressing us. And you, by you, he means the reader. He's writing to the Colossians, but they're just Christians just like us, so you can take this personally. You could say to yourself, he's talking to me here. Verse 21, and you who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. He's sending you a message. And he says, now listen, at one time you might have been alienated and separated from God, but you know what? I'm going to say it this way. It was all in your mind. It's all in your mind. People out here walking around in the world that think God is mad at them because of their bad behavior and because of all the things they've done, it's all in their mind. They don't know. And sometimes we sit in church don't know like we should know. They don't know that he's already made peace. He's already done something about their sin. You know, I've talked to people lots of times, many times, who say this to me because I try to give them good news, and they'll say, yeah, 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 but you don't know what I've done. And I always say, that's right, I don't know, but he knows. He knows all about everything you've done, and he already did something about it. And you know what he's done about it? He made peace with you. He removed it. He removed it as a factor. Now, why am I standing here in church telling you, you people, uh, you Christians this? Why am I not out here telling? Well, they need to hear it too. But you know what? As Christians even, we get under this little cloud of, of condemnation thinking that just because we you know, failed in some way or didn't do everything exactly right or didn't read our Bible as much as we should have thought we should have read it or, you know, maybe I should have talked to this person about it. You know, we can feel guilty over all kinds of things. And we get this little, this little inkling of God's disappointed with us or upset with us. And then if something bad happens, well, it's because God's mad at me. No, 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 none of that's true. He's not mad. If he had goodwill towards you before you're a Christian, even more now that you're a Christian, does he have goodwill towards you? It wasn't about your performance then. It's not about your performance now. It's all about his grace. It's all about his goodness in his work. What does he want from us? He wants us to believe it. He says, and you who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. He's put us back together. He's made the reconciliation. Notice this in verse 22. In the body of his flesh, that's what he did, through death, comma, to present you holy. That means his death did what was necessary to present you holy present you to who? To God, so that you might stand in his presence, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable 
in his sight. Now, you notice in these three verses here, and the reason I read this is because it's very much like what the angel said, having made peace through the uh, peace, goodwill towards men. Uh, there's a connection there. But you notice in these verses, he hadn't told you to do anything. Did you notice that? He's only told you what he's done. Well, what are we supposed to do with this kind of information? Well, verse 23 tells us, if you continue in the faith, you see, what I always say is, what we're supposed to do with this is believe it. And here he says, continue in the faith. That means continue believing it, uh, grounded and settled. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. In other words, don't let it go. Keep, hold on to it. It's easy to let it go. It's easy to forget about it. Yeah. It's easy to start getting your attention on, uh, on your own actions, which are always going to fall short, by the way. I, shouldn't, uh, I hope I'm not bursting your bubble by saying that. Um, there's never going to be a time in your life when you couldn't look at your life and say, I could have done better. Your actions will always fall short. But we're not in a relationship with God based on our actions, based on the actions of a Savior. So he says, continue in the faith, grounded and settled. Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard which was preached to every creature under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am now a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. He means that metaphorically because he was being whipped and beaten and treated badly. In my flesh, through, for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation which is given unto me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ, whereunto I also labor, uh, striving according to the working which worketh in me mightily. Now, that verse 28, I'd like to read that to you in conclusion from the message translation because it's really good. Now, could you give me the message on verse 28? We preach Christ, warning people not to add to the message. How about that? Yeah, don't, don't add to it. What's the message? That he did it. What, he, what the angel said, we bring you good tidings of great joy that will be to all people. For unto you is born a Savior. A Savior comes to save. In other words, don't add to it by saying, yeah, but you've got to do this and this and this. Uh, we warn people not to add to the message. We teach in a spirit of profound common sense so that we can bring each person to maturity. To be mature is to be basic. Christ, no more, no less. You know what that's saying? That's another way of saying it's all about him. Don't add to it. Don't add your, you know, part to it. What's our part to this? We're supposed to believe it. Put our faith in it. Rely on it. Trust in it. Well, let's all stand up.